All right, so we have this. Well, maybe I've actually started to answer it. Yeah, I had. So here's the question. They want it to work like this. Enter the first side, two. Enter the second side, two. Enter the third side, two. That triangle is equilateral. And so it's supposed to print one of two things. The triangle is equilateral or the triangle is not equilateral. So if I was going to do that, to make sure that it looks exactly like what they're expecting, I'm just going to copy that first message and do an input based on it. How about I just call them uh, x, y, and z for first, second, and third. x equals float parentheses input parentheses double quotes into the first side. Now rather than copy these things as well, why don't I just take this statement and copy and paste it and change it to say y and z in second and third side. So I have x, y, and z into the first side, enter the second side, into the third side. So what is the criteria for it being an equilateral triangle? Well, that's just one where all, they're all the three the same sides, right? All three sides are the same. That shouldn't be a hard if statement to write. It's going to say something like if x equals equals y and y equals equals z, print this message, else print that message. So if x equals equals y and y equals equals z, now there's no reason to do if x equals equals z. I talked to another student about it. He texted me and he said I should be checking for that and I agreed with him and then I decided it wasn't true. Because if you have this one, and you have this one, and you have this one, and you check these two to see if they're equal, and then you check these two to see if they're equal, if that was equal to that, and that was equal to that, then automatically that was equal to that. So that's enough. But it wouldn't hurt us if we wanted to add, if we wanted to feel totally secure, to add that third clause if x equals equals z, but I'm not going to. So if x equals equals y and y equal equals z, we're going to print this message. The triangle is equilateral. So again, to make sure that I get it exactly correct, I'm just going to copy that statement. This needs to be tabbed over one. Fortunately, it did. Print parentheses, double quotes, paste. And then I'm going to back tab so that I can make a say else colon lined up with the if and I have another print message to print print parentheses double quote and it's this one the triangle is not equilateral it's not letting me paste there all right that may be done I'm going to give it a shot. The end of the first side. Well, if they're all the same, it's equilateral. So one, one, one. I've run it to see that it worked, but you got to also make sure that you get the other output, right? You have to test both cases. So now I'm going to try it and type in one, two, three. The triangle is not equilateral. <clears throat> By my testing, it's working, so I'm going to come over here and run the tasks to get credit for it. So I click on the tasks, and then I click on the green checkbox, and it goes, and their website runs our code. Two out of two checks pass. Great work. What if I'd gotten an error message? If I'd gotten an error message, I would hope that it, well, now I'm not seeing how to expand the output. Okay, there it is, right? The arrow will show me how they test it. They test it for 2, 2, 2, and then they test it for 1, 2, 3. And what if I've just totally blatantly done something wrong, like I misspelled equilateral? 
how hard do they try to accommodate my carelessness? All right, test case incomplete, didn't work. Why? Because I misspelled it. That's why I just copy and paste the messages, so I'll be sure. But Python will still run either way. Oh, it'll run, yeah. I mean, these could have been written, you know, in Russian and the program technically be correct. C engage wouldn't count as correct. In Russian. Engage. <clears throat> okay, let me come look. It's only practice, right? I may change it to B4 grid, but I, I'll have to check to see if I agree with it. Let's see. Grr, come on. Fuck. All right, so now they're checking to see if it's a right triangle or not a right triangle. How do you check to see if it's a right triangle or not a right triangle? I already took a stab at solving and I'm going to get rid of that. If you're going to check to see if something's a right triangle or not a right triangle, you have to check to see if x squared is equal to the sum of y squared plus z squared. or if y squared is equal to the sum of x squared plus z squared, or, you know, you have to check all three ways. So one of the lines to do that, and I'm not going to do the whole thing because I'm just giving you the answer if that's the case, would be something like this. If x star star 2 is equal to parentheses, y star star 2 plus z star star 2, right? Because that's a Pythagorean theorem. Or, you know, if you wanted to take this off and use a square root function or whatever, but this is good enough, then we're going to print the triangle as a right triangle. Mistake, beginner mistake, and I did it. It doesn't like my equal sign. What I do wrong? Um, Boolean. Boolean. Well, what do I need to do to make that correct? Add their equal sign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good deal. Did not print anything because that is not an equilateral triangle. However, three, four, and five are. So if I run it again, but it's still probably not going to accept it because there are three ways you have to check it, right? Not just X, Y, and Z, 
but y z index and z x y right you have three different combinations you have to check because you don't know which way the triangle is rotated I'm gonna leave that one alone Cengage would give us mind tap without the course key with Cengage Unlimited. Oh, yeah. You can't do that. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. If you're going to look for another textbook. Mm -hmm. Okay, just to make sure these are not out of bounds, I'm going to go and look at the other ones that are going to be for credit. Once I've slipped in edit mode, it hates me. Let me get out of it. Okay, modify this guessing game program so that the user thinks of a number that the computer must guess. The computer must make no more than the minimum number of guesses and it must prevent the user from cheating by entering misleading hints. Use I'm out of guesses and you cheated and hooray I've got it in X tries as your final output. All right, I'm going to go on to the next one. Standard science experiment is to drop a ball and see how far or how high it bounces. Once the so-called bounciness of the ball has been determined, the ratio gives a bounciness index. For example, if a ball dropped from a height of 10 bounces 6 feet, that's a bounce index of 60%, right? That high, and then the next time, let's say it's bounce a uh, factor is 50%. So you drop it from 10 feet, it's going to go 10. And then it's going to go up 5, and then back down 5. And then what's 50% of 5? It's going to go up 2.5 and down back 2.5. And what's half of 2.5? 1.25, right? You see what it's doing? It's bouncing each time, each one of these being 0.5 of the prior number. So let's see if we can figure out this is one that I had arguments with about um, myself last time. So if it starts at 10 feet, the distance traveled by the ball is 16 feet after one bounce because it went down and then back up. Notice that the distance gets successively smaller. They want us to think that if we start off at 25 and it's 0.5 each time that it'll finally wind up being 65.65. Let's see if uh, we can make an algorithm that kind of agrees with that. Starting off at 25. It falls 25 feet and then how high does it rise? Half that. 
Well, that's only one bounce. So it's going to go back down 12.5. Sounds like to me it's going to be a while loop. Yeah, exactly. And so the second bounce is going to be half that again. So it comes over here, what's half of 12.5? It's like um, 6.75, I think. 6.75 up, 6.75 down. That's the second bounce. And then the third bounce will be half of that again. Now my brain's not good enough to divide by, by two. So I'm going to just say that it's 3.4 .4 up and 3.4 down. Now, I wonder if I'm understanding the problem correctly and I'm going to get the answer that they did. If I'm going to find out. I'm just going to do this. This isn't correct, of course. Print. What were my numbers? 25 plus 12.5 times 2 plus 6.75 times 2 plus, what was that, not last, 3.5. 4 times 2. Let's see if we get close. Why is my green arrow for running it not down here? Okay, fine. Can be that way about it. Talk about a sin gauge issue. I don't know what I did wrong there, but okay. They say it's 70 dots 5. I said that it was going to be alrighty. So what I do wrong? What's the difference between their answer and mine? So I was off by 4.8. I don't see why. Has anybody else spotted why? I was just thinking maybe it's because maybe it's because I should not have added that last bounce, 3.4, but that wasn't the difference. That wasn't the difference between my, theirs and mine. Is it going up by half each time? Yeah, did I make a mistake? Yeah, I totally well, I did because I said 6.75. And what is it really? It's 6.25. Half of 12.5 is 6.25. And then half of uh, 6.25 is 3.1. Somebody help me. 3.125. Okay, 3.125 plus 3.125. Let's see if that helps. One thing I'm wondering is if they only care about the upward, right? Because here we. Uh, uh, And then that's back up and down one more time. I'm wondering at which point it wants to stop. So let's revise my numbers here. Six dot two five. And three dot one two five. So they don't want the last 3.125, and that's what threw me off last time. They're counting the bounce only to go. They're saying that's a bounce. That's a second bounce. And that's a third bounce. And that's just weird to me. To me, the bounce ought to be the entire cycle, right? Because if it bounces once, I don't know. But they don't count it that way. They did not want to see that last one. So how would we code that? How would, could we code that to make that work? A signal value loop. Well, a loop is a good idea. A number of times that we bounce is a good idea. So as we were looking at this, we had our original height, right? And then for the first bounce, 
we went up half that height. And then that was a complete iteration. That was the first bounce. Then after the second bounce, say we stored that in a new variable, right? But anyway, for the second bounce, we again did this half the height. And then we did 0.25 of the height. And that bounce is done. And then the third bounce, we did 0.25 of the height. And then we did 0.125 of the height. So it's slightly odd, isn't it? How'd you, how would you do that? If you need a counter, count one, two, three. You'd want to count up from the first bounce up to the last bounce. You could use a range statement for that, or you could use a while statement for that. I'm going to take a stab at that. Shouldn't be doing your homework for you, but this is an interesting problem. It's an interesting problem, at least it is for me, because last time I had to ditch it and tell the class that they didn't have to do it because we weren't getting the right answer. Now I'm thinking harder about it. I'm hoping we do. Okay, so what are we going to do? I'm not going to write the whole thing, but I'm going to say x is equal to 3. But I'm, instead, I'm going to call that bounces equal to 3 so that I have good variables. That's that variable. The initial height is equal to 25, they said. And the index is equal to 0.5. So now I need to count, according to this, some counter that goes 1, 2, and 3. While loop would be perfect for it. A range statement would be perfect for it. Let's just use a while loop this time. What about like a for loop that counts down? That would work just as well. You could use a for loop that counts down. Counts down to 0. Or you'd put 0 as your second range. Like bounce 3, 2, 1. It'd work either way. I'm going to do, you know, why not? That's a cool way of doing it. For x in range, starting with the number of bounces, going until 0, subtracting 1 each time. And that 0 is 1 past the stopping point. So the bounces variable, is, the x variable is going to go 3, 2, 1, and then stop. It's not going to hit that. Remember, that range goes 1 past it. So just to let us know where we are, I'm going to print the bounce variable out so I can see it, right? Well, that's not the bounce variable. Let's, let's just put that there. Now, that's enough. Now, that's enough for me to at least you know, get a clue as to what I'm doing. We're on lecture HIJ. Wow, semester's already half over. It's uh, not really, right? It's week five, All right? Yeah. All right, I just want to make sure that it's doing anything. Okay, so we have something that's counting 3, 2, 1. So looking back at our thing, what happens here? We add the bounce height and then half the bounce height. It's a two-step process for each iteration. So in that tucked away inside the for loop, we need to do that and that. I need some kind of total in order to hold that stuff. Total equals zero, right? We start off at zero. But then we do total plus equals I'm not really liking calling that initial. I'm just going to call that height. Total plus equals the height. And then we need to modify the height variable by the ratio, right? Because we add the complete amount first, and then we add, you know, the index version of it, 50% version of it. So we're going to modify height by the percentage. Height times equals the index. That'll chop it in half if that's that. And then we add it to the total again. 
total plus equals height. Why don't we print these things out too to make sure that we like what's going on. So on the bounce down, we went the entire height and on the bounce back up, we went half the height. On the bounce down, we went half the height and we went back up a quarter of the height. Yeah, I'm liking it. I'm thinking this might do the trick. Why don't we put a print statement in here inside the loop so that we can watch the values change. Height equals in quote comma height and then total wait print parentheses quote total equals in quote total and I'm just going to add a little comment here completely unnecessary in for And I believe I got the answer that they wanted. I think that's a working algorithm. Right, what did they want it to say? 65.625, is that what I got, please? It is. Okay, yeah, I now understand the problem according to the terms that they actually wanted to do it. And this is a working algorithm for solving it. it doesn't do everything completely right. It's printing stuff where it shouldn't print. It's not asking for the input and stuff like that. But that is the algorithm for solving it. So you ought to be able to get credit for that one by doing that. So looking at 3.5. A local biologist needs to program to predict the population growth. We need the initial number of organisms, the rate of growth, the number of hours it takes to achieve this rate, and the number of hours during which the population grows. So, if you start off at 500 organisms and a growth rate of 2 in 6 hours, assuming that none of the organisms die, the population should double in size every 6 hours. That's what they're saying. It takes a growth rate of 6 hours to double. So, after allowing for 6 hours, we should have 1,000 organisms, and after 12 hours, we should have 2,000. Write a program that takes these inputs and displays a prediction of the total population. And so our example here, our example input is enter the initial number of organisms, 10, enter the rate of growth, 2, enter the number of hours to achieve the rate, 2, enter the total number of hours, 6. Okay, now I'm not a mathematician, but it seems like the simplistic way that they've shown it here is somewhat deceptive because what if the number of hours is not an even number of compared to that, right? What if it said the number of hours to achieve that growth is two? What if I type in 1.75? I don't think it's gonna be a clean multiple of that. But maybe their input always gives us clean multiples in order to make it easy. To find out what their input and output is, I'm just gonna write three input statements here and print a garbage answer. Input, input, input. And it's totally fair to do this. We're going to find out and then print oops. Right? Okay. So when I run it, it's asking for three pieces of input and it prints oops. Clearly not what they want, but hopefully I can run the task, see how we failed. See what sets of input they are asking for.
Zero out of four checks failed. Are they going to let us see the failures? All right, your growth rate of five over two hours for 25 hours. There's a case where the number of hours does not match. It's not an even multiple of that. Growth rate of two over two hours, for six hours total, that does match. Growth rate of one hour for six hours, that does match. Seven over seven, that does match. So what's the basis? Compounded hourly? I'm actually somewhat stymied by this. I could take a stab at writing it, but let me explain one more time what I mean. Their example is so crystal clear. Growth rate of two over six hours and in 12 hours. Sure, great. That just means that we doubled it twice. Started off with 500 and then it growth rated two, so it wound up at after 1,000 after the first six hours, and then it wound up being 2,000 after the next six hours. Do you have any suggestions for how to do that? Because I know it's a series, I don't... Uh, the wording's weird, just the way they have it worded. But it uh, depends what they mean, like what type of growth is it, exponential logarithmic growth. Just by saying a growth rate, it's like... You know, we could bust out yield calculus and could do it that way, but I think that's it. Did I show y'all code bat, coding bat? Mm -hmm. I like how for some of their problems they have the answer. The tools that we have up to this point are pretty much loops and if statements. Is this weird into the number of hours to achieve the rate of growth? Is this, is this weird? Usually when we talk about growth rates, they, they give you initial population. They tell you what kind of growth it is. Uh, yeah. They give you a rate, then they ask you after X amount of time, what's the population? Just the, the, the number of hours to achieve growth rate. It's really weird. So could we divide it by two to get it down to a, a single number of hours? At least according to what they want. Like if it's going to grow 50% in two, is it going to grow 25% in one? Is that the kind of resolution um, adequate to them? That's not, a, a, that's not mathematically correct. The exponential population growth equation. Your initial value, you start off with a thousand folks. Your growth rate is 50%. Your unit of time I'm going to make it 100% and it grows twice if it grew once. Okay. I'm feeling like ditching this problem because this equation is giving us something completely different. If I'm not understanding it, its initial population, the growth rate is dot five six. The length of time is 125. Did they ever give us the population growth shown as a geometric progression? The geometric progression is a simplified way to show exponential population growth. Starting with one couple, assume that every female has four children. 
The following table compares the population growth in seven generations. So you double your population each time. <clears throat> First generation is two, second generation is four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and 128. I'm really tempted to skip this one. Uh, skip what? The population one? Or to code it and see if it, it comes out right, but if I do the coding for y'all on every one of these, then it's kind of pointless. Let's go look at the next one. This is a fun one, actually. How to calculate pi formula um, via formula. I used to assign this one as one of my own programming assignments. Write a program that allows the user to specify the number of iterations to calculate pi. And it's via this formula. <clears throat> After one iteration, the value of pi divided by 4 is 1. After two iterations, the value of pi is 1 minus 1, 3. After the third iteration, the value of pi is 1 minus 1, 3 plus 1, 5. And whatever this adds up to would need to be multiplied by 4 to get the final answer. And then after four iterations, that's the value of pi. Enter the number of iterations. Well, let's see if this works. Let's make sure that I understand their definition of iteration. So I'm going to go back to idle shell and I'm just going to print out that but I need to multiply it by 4 so 4 times that nope. and that was after the minus 1 7 so we're going to tack on 1 over 9 copy it to make it easier than what I've been doing. All right, just blow up. Here we go. 3.3. How close is that? 3.3968. 3.3968. Okay. So they're saying that that's five iterations. One minus one over three plus one over five minus one over seven plus one over nine. Plus so, what, uh, so what have you got going on here? Sometimes you're adding, sometimes you're subtracting. The number is actually 1 over 1, minus 1 over 3, plus 1 over 5, minus 1 over 7, plus 1 over 9. So you have this number oscillating. Um, How would you do something like that? Well, a while loop, or I love for loops. Why don't we just do 4x in range, you know, 5, or something like that. But we need this number to be going up 1, 3, five, seven, nine, it's going up by two each time, but it's oscillating. How do you get something to oscillate like that? How is it going to be positive one term and negative the other? Well, two ways. The simplest in my mind is just to multiply it by negative one each time, right? So one over one, and then you multiply that one by negative one, and so it becomes minus one over three, and then you multiply that negative three by negative one, and it becomes positive five, so plus one over five. So let's write a program that just demonstrates that. 1, negative 3, plus 5, minus 7, plus 9. Because if we can do that, you can solve the problem. So we need some max iteration, right? The number of iterations, or the number of times. For x in range, starting at 1, and going up one past the number of times. I don't think that I like where I'm going with this. I'm just going to say for x in range, num, where num is a number of iterations. To see if we uh, you know, can get it to work their way, I'm going to say the number of iterations is 5. And our denominator is going to start flipping, right? 
to 1, to negative 3, to positive 5, to negative 1, 6. So I'm going to just call it denom. So what am I going to do here? I'm going to print out the denominator. Let's just print it out. And then I'm going to multiply the denominator by negative 1. Right, denom times equals negative 1. I think that'll give us the behavior that we uh, want. You need to put the negative sign. Yeah, when multiplying by 1 over and over, is that going to do much good? Nope. All right, thank you for catching that before I got annoyed. Here we go. All righty, I did something dumb. <laughs> what do I need to do to get that to work? Well, I need go to modify my thinking a little bit. One, you need to go up by two. Oh, wait, I think you need to go... Non so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the multiplier equal to a totally different value. So sometimes it'll be positive one, sometimes it'll be a negative one. So I'm going to print the denominator times that factor. I'm going to switch that factor and then I'm going to increase the denominator by two each time. I think that's closer, right? So the first time multiplier is equal to positive one, so it's going to print positive one and then it's going to switch to be negative. Then denominator becomes 1 plus 3 is 3, and it's going to print out negative 3. I believe that will be our sequence. It's too low. Yeah, where's my shell? And that's it. That's the pattern that we wanted to see. So what would you do? You would just add 1 over 1, subtract 1 over 3, add 1 over 5, subtract 1 over 7, and add 1 over 9. That may be about far enough as far as these programming problems are concerned. Because the other two are probably going to be the stupid ones. <laughs> So six is an acceptable programming problem in my opinion, and that's the last one that I signed for a grade. Let's go and ogle the others. Um, we have until four fifteen. Teachers are paid on a schedule that provides salary based on a number of years of teaching experience. An example. 30,000 dollars annual interest rate into the number of years 10. So 10 la di da di da di da di da. That's a little un. Uh, so again, that's kind of just compounded yearly. I think this is actually an acceptable problem. I think I'm going to make this one for a grade and undo 3.3 .3 if I possibly can, if it's not too late. Three is no longer for a grade. Three dot seven is gonna be. If I don't get to this before, y'all have actually submitted some of these for grades and won't let me change them back to practice. All right. Yeah, we got a lot of grades. Uh, is three point five the growth? Pardon me. Great. Is three point five the growth rate problem? Uh -huh. Oh, did I mean to remove that one as well? Yes, yes, you are absolutely correct. 3.5 is going to be terminated by extreme prejudice. All right. We can write our own growth rate problem. That makes a little bit more sense. Yeah, this, this that wording takes two hours to achieve that growth rate. That's 
kind of weird. Okay, so I'm going to make up my own growth rate problem. So say the world's population is 7 billion. I don't know what it really is, but it's 7 billion. That, that's just what we're going to pretend. So I need nine zeros after that to make it a billion. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Or let's just do it for America. America has a population of 500 million. That sounds a little bit high. What is a population of yes? Like 325 million. Yeah, 327 million. So the population of the America is 327 million. One, two, three, four, five, six. Is this a language where you can use underscores to represent commas? to say that each year a certain number of babies are born, each year there's a certain number of deaths, and then each year a certain number of people immigrate to the United States. So let's find the number of deaths per year in the U.S. Ooh. 731 per 100,000 people. That's for the day or the year? That was supposed to be for the year. Tell you what, we'll just base it. Oh, fine, you're not going to tell me a total? Oh, fine, you're not telling me a total? Here we go, here we go. According to the CDC, America lost about 3 million people. And then we're going to find out how many people are added each year. So deaths each year is equal to about 3 million. And of course this is bogus, right? I mean, because each year changes. But anyways, because it's a percentage, a certain percentage of your... But we're just going to roll with it. Births per year... USA, or how about births in, in 2019? And the number of births was 3,791,000, so let's just say 3,700. Okay. And how about immigration? Let's find out how many people immigrated into the country. And then there's immigrations where people are leaving. I misspelled immigrant wrong. Immigration. How to spell immigration wrong? Uh, I don't know. There we go. Let's just go with that number. 800,000. Because that's how many people applied for naturalization to become citizens. So we're going to say immigration equals 800,000. And I'm not going to count people leaving the United States. Nobody wants to leave. Everybody wants to stay here. Okay. So how would we calculate what the population would be after three years? Four x in range 3. What does that really do? That counts 0, 1, and 2. Just a reminder, if you leave off that first number, it defaults to starting at 0. So I could rewrite this to say 0, comma, 3, comma, 1, and it does exactly the same thing. Now the way my brain works, I start counting at 1, right? But if I know that I'm just going to iterate three times. That's the easiest way to type it if I don't care about the value of x or if I remember that x actually starts off at zero. And we don't need to know that number. We just need it to repeat three times. 
So each year, we need to subtract the number of deaths, add the number of births, and add the number of immigrants. So population minus equal the number of deaths, population plus equal the number of births, and then population plus equal the number of immigrants. And then let's print the result. Now I can think of a reason to go from one to four so that we can put that in our answer, right? After one year, after two years, after three years, after four, rather than saying after zero years. So I'm gonna make that one comma four comma one just so to count one, two, and three. So let's print the year. You know, I could be awesome and actually use complete variable names, right? And then let's print the pop at that point. Wait, can you actually put uh, year as 2000 something? Yeah, we could add 2018 plus our answer, right? Since these facts were for 2018 about. So the population's creeping up. That's not a bad idea. I like that. Let's uh, go and do that. Let's start our year at 2018, and let's keep going to 2025. Still not quite right, but let's just run with it. Why do we say that? Because if we start at 2018, you'd actually care about 2019, right? So let's, I don't want to make this too fancy. I'm going to go back to the way it was. But that was a cool idea. We could add that right down here, which was your suggestion. Probably a little bit better. There we go. Right? For three years, all right. Let's say for 10 years. So I better put 11 there, so it'll count out from 1 to 10. All right. So we're going to have about, you know, assuming 20 million more people after about 10 years. Interesting. <coughs> I was like, United States about to be overcrowded. <coughs> Over with. <laughs> so it would be too trivial to ask you to just input these values and then that value as well. It'd be a little bit trivial. I'm going to change that back to just being 10 because, right, does the same thing, counts from 0 to 9, which is 10 iterations. Same, same number. Have we done an? In <clears throat> Didn't we do a compound interest problem already? Is that a yes or a no on it? No, um, we did some time ago. We're going to modify that concept a little bit. Previously, we just asked for the user to enter some values. Instead, we're going to write a loop that increments this t variable from 1 to 10 so that you can say, okay, after one year, I earned, you know, $300. For two years, I earned you know, $400, $500. So these, are, these values here, we care a little bit more now than we did before. I want to see the interest earned and not the total amount. Or do I? Yeah. How do you calculate interest earned? It's just the principal minus the final, right? So our starting amount is A, and then our, print, our end result is P. So how much was earned? is the final amount, assuming you don't have a negative interest rate, and if you do, I'd switch, to, I'd switch banks. Here we go, right? So that's the amount of earned. So what are we gonna do? Same thing. Write an interest calculator that shows the interest earned on a starting amount 
over a number of years. Um, do I have to submit a data report review form? If yes, please. Yes, please. So the ones you missed, absolutely, because you do want to watch them, right? Hope so. All right. So the user enters a maximum value for t according to this equation. Your program will loop from 1 to t, or from 1 to the max value, printing out the amount earned each year. You still need to ask before it starts for A, for the interest, and for the number of times a year. We could just hard code that to one, I guess. So the user will ask for A, the starting amount, R, the interest rate, and N, Let's just assume n is 1. We're going to calculate one time a year. Assume n is 1. And then the user enters the max value of t for this equation. Your program will loop from 1 to max t, printing out the amount earned each year. Now I'll write this program and copy paste the results in here so that you can get an idea of what I want it to look like but that's probably actually already enough for you to know. That makes sense? You can take your prior program, all you're gonna do is you're gonna hard code n equal to one rather than ask them. So if you asked n is equal to input, n is equal to float input, whatever, just say n equals one there. And then you're gonna input a new variable called max t, which is a number of years and you're going to have a while or a for loop that's going, to in a, that's going to increment t each time. This is not an exact model of what we would need to do, right? We could modify this so that it actually looked like a single equation, which is what you're going to have, right? So population equals population plus the births plus the immigrants, minus the number of deaths, right? That's doing it all in one line. And then the amount of increase would have been last year's population minus this year's, right, or something like that. But that's close enough. If you needed to do some further calculation, you could do that. I think this is a close model for the interest problem, except the equation is considerably more difficult, right? It has several things to do, but you've already written the program which calculates that. Does that make any sense? I think 75% of y'all gonna nod. Some of y'all are looking terrified. If you're terrified, come and talk to me, right? Because I have office hours immediately after this class. <clears throat> I just want to make sure I'm in the right window here. Yours reads, uh, uh, well, Honestly, I've been switching from window to window to window. Uh, it would be a miracle if you were actually <coughs> to okay. get all the, on, all the windows I'm around. On, uh, untitled period. Your right, that untitled is my note card. That I was just using that as kind of a scratch period, but I need to copy and paste this actually into the homework box. I mean into, right, like that. Okay, now I had a question in, uh, in text. Let me uh, go review what the question was. I wanted to give a demonstration of that to solve a prior homework if you were late on that. So let's go and look at it. I suppose you're fine with us if we just use the interest formula, right? The homework gives the interest formula. Oh, it does? Right, right, right. I mean, it's not here. I will rewrite it to be totally correct. The homework here, doesn't it? Right there, right there. Yeah. Well, there's a, so that, that gives you like a starting amount at, over some time what you'll end up with, but there's a civic form that will just tell you what the interest occurred was. Well, in this case, the interest occurred would just be, um, 
P minus that. Right. Yeah. And amount but minus one P. That just gives you straight up interest without. Having oh, okay. To well, that'd be cool. If you wanted to, uh, if you want to text that to me, I'll modify the homework so that it'll be a single step rather than two. That'd be cool. Were we already looping the? No, no, no. Okay. So, one of the questions I got was how to do the looping where we asked for the values, but if the starting amount was a thousand, right, then we wanted to just stop. So I'm going to modify my population thing here to ask for this data, right? So I'm not going to start population off with that. I'm going to, you know, set these values and then ask the user for that stuff. But what are we going to do first? We're going to ask them for the population. And then we're going to tab everything else over because if the population is zero, we don't want to do it. And if the population is not zero, we do. So I'm going to tab that over. And what am I going to do here? I'm going to ask for the population. The population is equal to, why don't we just use whole numbers this time? Int parentheses, input parentheses, what is the starting population? Uh, you want to get rid of that 37, yeah, I would leave that as a comment. It's just a good value. But then we're going to check our while loop, right? So while population not equal to zero in those uh, parentheses. And I should tell them that they can type zero to quit, right? What is the starting population or zero to quit? Sorry, it's a long statement. I could break it up into two, but you get the idea. What is the starting population or zero to quit followed by two close? All right, and so while the population is not equal to zero, that means that they're really curious. And so we're going to ask for the number of deaths per year, and we're going to ask for the number of births and ask for the number of immigrants. Now I'm only going to ask for one of them in the interest of time, right? Death is equal to int parentheses, input parentheses, how many deaths per year. I'm going to leave the other two alone. I could, yeah, it, it's so easy to change an input statements, right? Yeah, you get what I'm doing now. And then at the bottom of my loop, I need to ask them again, right? Because my while loop will be an infinitely repeating loop if the population is always what they typed in originally. So after we've printed out our for loop down here, or did whatever calculation we needed, including calculating interest, we would ask them again, what is the starting population or zero? So I hope you see what we're doing. We're asking them the question first, and then we're doing while that value is not equal to zero, we're using that. We're asking, this is separate from the pro program that we uh, are doing this week. You don't have to do it this week, but if you feel like doing it that way, it's totally fine because you've already got the structure in place. And then we ask for the population again, and then we should be done. This is the end of the loop. Let's see how that goes. So what is the starting population? It's 100. How many deaths per year? One. OK, great. It increased. And I botched it. Why is it asking me how many deaths per year without asking me the starting population? I must have copy and pasted the wrong question. I never did copy and paste it, even though I said I was going to. Let's do that. Didn't you see me do that? All right. I thought I had. All right. What's the starting population? 100. How many deaths per year? One. What's the starting population? You see, it's asking me again. 200. How many deaths per year? Two. What's the starting population? 100. How many people die a year? 100 pretty grim, but since we have high, okay, now you see the, the ridiculousness of having the birth rate being, you know, 4 million or whatever it is. And I'm finally done, so I'm going to type in zero to quit.
So if you did not finish the interest program, the first one, to work like that, that's how you do it. Just ask the question, make your while loop based on that answer, and then ask the question again. Hope that makes sense. I hope that's good to go. Make sense to y'all? Okay. I will now make a Dropbox. Indeed. I will now make a Dropbox. Uh, did <laughs>